Hi, and uh, welcome to our CHEST webinar on minimally invasive treatment for COPD. Uh, my name is Milan Han, and I am a pulmonologist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I take care of a lot of patients with COPD, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Uh, we're really happy to have you here. So I think as everyone's aware, in the uh, last few years, we've had an advent of new treatments for uh, COPD. And the goal for today's session is to really just help everyone understand what the current standard of care is uh, and what that workup involves. Uh, I have been caring for patients with COPD for the, roughly the last uh, 20 years or so. And uh, lung volume reduction surgery has been uh, something that, that's been present for a while now and we know can be helpful for patients with very severe emphysema. But with the advent of minimally invasive endobronchial valves that have been available in the US since 2018, this has changed the way I practice. This has changed the way I evaluate patients. And so one of the goals for today is to really help people think through when they should be thinking about uh, this type of evaluation for patients and what kind of patients we think uh, the data points to as uh, providing benefit for. Uh, there are still a lot of unmet needs for patients with COPD. Uh, fortunately, the inhaled therapies that are available uh, do provide uh, symptom improvement as well as exacerbation reduction. But I think we all have patients who still tell us that they are short of breath despite maximal inhaler uh, therapy. And, and with the advent of uh, valves, we have to kind of now make sure we're including this therapy in our mental checklist of things that patients uh, might qualify for. Because the, the as we're gonna hear about today, uh, the uh, type of patient that would potentially benefit from endobronchial valve therapy uh, is uh, potentially a little uh, milder and has more moderate disease than perhaps the very severe patients that we were uh, typically referring for uh, lung volume reduction surgery. So the goal for the webinar today will really be to uh, help everyone understand what endobronchial valves are, what is the data about the risks and benefits, how do you recognize patients that are candidates, what kind of workup should you do, and what really are the strategies uh, for working with an interventionalist team uh, to get patients uh, successfully uh, through uh, the evaluation and, and treatment process. So I'd like to, at this point to uh, introduce our uh, panel we're going to uh, then uh, move into discussion. And at the end, if you have questions, well, actually, as we're going along, if you have questions, you are welcome uh, to put them in the chat. And then at hopefully roughly quarter uh, till the top of the hour, we will move into a live uh, Q&A. And I'll uh, have a chance to address those questions in the chat at that point. So I am going to have our uh, panelists uh, go ahead and uh, and introduce themselves. I'm going to uh, first ask Dr. Uh, Jonathan Kerman to introduce himself. Thank you so much, Dr. Hahn. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with everyone uh, tonight on this topic. Um, uh, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, uh, so I am excited to share uh, knowledge that I've gained here. Um, I run the Interventional Pulmonary Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, we're a, a large tertiary care academic medical center. We've been using Zephyr valves for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction since uh, um, 2019, since November of that year. Uh, so we started um, around the start of the pandemic and we have managed to weather the storm uh, and we have a very robust practice now. We've done about a hundred cases so far. Um, so we've gained a lot, of, a lot of experience during that time. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Dr. Martin, could you uh, tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and your practice? Um, hi, everyone. Again, thank you for inviting me and also for the uh, opportunity to also share my experience. Um, my name is Rolita Martin. I um, am the interventional pulmonologist at Piedmont Healthcare, which is also a um, tertiary care center, but uh, it's a community-based center in um, Atlanta, Georgia. And we are also like the largest healthcare system in the state. 
I um, started the uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction program using the Zephyr valve in February of 2019. And uh, we did experience some hiccups during the pandemic um, in terms of like um, our normal evaluation process and procedure process. But we have done about, um, I would say, 70 uh, cases so far and we evaluated more than 300 patients. Thank you, Dr. Martin. So as we begin the session today, can you just explain to people what are endobronchial valves and how they work? Yes, I would actually would like to share a little animation with you um, as I am discussing um, how endobronchial valves work. So um, endobronchial valves are very small implantable devices. They're one-way valves, which can, we can insert bronchoscopically into a target area of the lung. And by deploying them, we basically, um, one way to describe how they achieve the results is basically they improve the mechanics of breathing. By inserting the valves in the target area of the lung, um, we are able to release trapped, um, trapped air. And with that reduction of hyperinflation, we are able to um, get better diaphragm and chest wall mechanics. The remaining lung um, also has a better elastic recoil, which leads to improved expiratory airflow. And with that, we're also able to reduce the variation in regional ventilation and perfusion, and it leads to a better matching and alveolar gas exchange. So this video was just like a quick um, visual on how the valves work and how over time the, really, uh, the trapped air gets released, which leads to the clinical benefit. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin, for uh, explaining that. I think the video is really helpful. Uh, Dr. Kerman, could you tell me a little bit more about the clinical trials uh, that have demonstrated both the risks and benefits of this procedure? Absolutely. Uh, and I think this is where, um, where uh, uh, valves in general and Zephyr valves in particular really shine. There's a tremendous amount of data um, here that is um, uh, very, very well done, um, uh, robust data published in uh, some of the key journals, um, which you can see uh, here on the slide that support this technology. Um, uh, you can see that there are basically four major uh, multi-center randomized controlled uh, trials. Well, one is single center, but the others are multi-center. Um, these are involving heterogeneous and homogeneous disease. Um, uh, they're all fairly large studies uh, with the Liberate study um, um, containing 190 patients, uh, and they range in, in length from 6 to 12 months. And across all of these studies, what's important to note is that there were significant improvements in lung function, exercise capacity, and quality of life as assessed by the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire. So regardless of, of the emphysema distribution, um, uh, there was significant improvement across the board um, in those three categories among all these different studies. And the overall procedural success rate, um, which people like to talk about, uh, you know, was, was either 90% or very close to it. Again, in the intervention arm, in all these different studies. So we're seeing very consistent results um, um, across a number of, of, of different clinical trials here. Uh, and so this is not experimental anymore. Um, this is not you know, in clinical trial phase. This is something that, um, that is FDA approved, has been uh, since 2018 and supported by tremendous uh, you know, data um, published in leading journals. So. Well, thank you for that uh, summary, Jonathan. So I think, it, you know, one of the things that's Im important to remember is we do see physiologic improvement. Obviously, we're not getting rid of the emphysema, but we're, we're minimizing its impact on the functioning uh, of the lung. Uh, and, uh, but uh, one of the other questions that I had was, uh, are there any uh, you know, when we're counseling patients, it's great. We're talking about the benefits, but were there any side effects or any other adverse events seen in the clinical trials that we would need to counsel patients about? Sure. 
So no procedure is without risks and bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, BLVR for short, is the same way. But the nice thing is there's a fraction of the amount of morbidity and mortality seen with some of the surgical alternatives. So in this case, there's a risk of pneumothorax postoperatively. Typically, we think of pneumothorax as a complication. In this case, I would argue that it's more of a sign that the procedure has been successful because what's happening is you are using valves to block airflow to a lobe causing lobar ad atelectasis. Uh, and like Dr. Martin said, thereby improving respiratory mechanics by taking pressure off of the diaphragm and off of the intercostal muscles and giving the ipsilateral lobe um, some uh, um, uh, room to room to expand. When that expansion occurs rapidly, uh, that can lead to stretching and subsequent tearing sometimes of the visceral pleura. That's how you get pneumothorax. And so again, in this case, it's more of a sequelae of a successful procedure as opposed to a true complication, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, pneumothorax does occur um, in around 20, 25% of patients. So it's not uncommon. We expect it afterwards. We are prepared for it. And part of the reason um, that we um, um, keep people in the hospital afterwards is to monitor them for this. And so most patients will stay in the hospital for three to five days postoperatively to make sure that they do okay. And if they do have a, a pneumothorax afterwards, we can address it rapidly. Um, and if people are doing well after that, then they go home. There's, there, are, there are no restrictions once they go home. Um, and importantly, for people who do develop pneumothorax after this, once they get past that, there is no difference in the outcomes between that group and the people who did not have pneumothorax afterwards. Thank you for that uh, summary. That's really helpful. I, I want to really kind of move into what I hope is the meat of the discussion here, which is helping physicians understand how they would work patients up, what, you know, so assuming you're not an interventionalist like myself, you know, uh, Dr. Martin, can you tell me which patients are eligible for valve therapy? And for someone like me, what is the best way for me to identify eligible patients in a typical pulmonary practice where maybe they don't have an interventionalist? What I usually um, advise colleagues who um, are thinking about referring patients for, uh, for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction um, is to consider them in patients who obviously carried a diagnosis of emphysema, specifically severe emphysema. And typically we're looking when their FEV1 drops below 50 and um, they're feeling that the patients are still quite symptomatic and experience breathlessness despite maximal medical therapy. Um, so anytime you're thinking about further escalating care or changing inhalers and patients continue to have symptoms, um, then it might be worth sending these patients for an evaluation. Um, I would like to just point out that um, if you're not sure, um, then it's always worth just um, you know, sending these patients or have um, establish a channel of communication with um, a local um, expert who can kind of guide you through the process. And I think that after the first several referrals, the picture will be a lot clearer for most um, you know, general pulmonologists in terms of like who the patients are and kind of like what's expected for the referral. But in general, we want to set a pretty low bar um, for patients to be referred and to think about it before they get really deconditioned and um, their disease is really too advanced for us to be actually able to intervene and help them. Um, so in general, I know that in general pul pulmonary practice, most physicians uh, follow their patients with um, serial spirometry. Um, so you will be able to see a drop in that. Um, and then, like I said, usually the cutoff is um, when the FEV1 drops uh, below 45, 50%. Um, now, for the procedure to be really successful, we also uh, basically say that in general, we recommend the residual volume or the evidence of significant air trapping to be um, 
set 175% of predicted to 200% of predicted. But we also understand that um, not all pulmonologists practice easily have um, access to a body box or, or the staff and resources to perform that routinely. So even if the patients don't have that um, you know, documented lung volumes uh, and evidence of severe air trapping, it's still worth to probably refer them for an evaluation. All right, so that's really helpful, Dr. Martin. So I think what I've heard so far is uh, ideally, we're looking for a patient with FV1 under 45% predicted where emphysema is suspected. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that could be, you know, that I know the more full evaluation will ultimately include uh, uh, plethysmography. So if that's something easily available, that I think is an easy box to, box to check. But if you don't have that, you know, and you still, you know, based on, say, chest X-ray, low DLCO, you see hyperinflation, uh, et cetera, that, that is certainly a patient I, that's got, you know, persistent dyspnea, that's definitely uh, a patient that, that we should consider. Um, I, Dr. Kerman, I, I, I'm curious, you know, I know there is a lot of variation in practices across the country. So I know, for instance, Dr. Martin's practice, she's got some advanced practice uh, uh, COPD doctors that can do a lot of that work up and then send them over. But uh, but I know, uh, Jonathan, in talking to you before, you do a lot of the work up yourself. So tell me a little bit about the interaction you have with your referring colleagues. Like Dr. Martin said, um, patients who are good candidates for evaluation for this procedure are going to be folks with emphysema who are still short of breath despite being on their inhalers. Um, and when I'm um, out talking to general pulmonologists and referring physicians, um, I generally start out by keeping it broad like that, because as an interventional pulmonologist, I would rather have somebody be, be evaluated for this and maybe not necessarily be a candidate at this time, but at least they are on my radar then. Um, so it allows me to kind of keep track uh, of, of, of patients moving forward. And the other um, uh, thing that I think about is if they're not a candidate for BLVR, um, then maybe they're a candidate for some of the clinical trials that we have or, or potentially even for lung transplant referral. So, um, so when patients uh, uh, come to me, they're really coming for a comprehensive uh, procedural COPD evaluation. Um, so they're gonna kind of be considered for everything all at once. Yeah, I think- um, Sorry, go ahead, please. No, I was just, you know, one of the, the other things, at least that I deal with at my center is trying to understand who might uh, uh, benefit from valves versus the traditional lung volume reduction surgery, which we do know has survival uh, uh, benefit. We just, uh, we don't have the, the similar kind of survival trials for the endobronchial valve. So I think for severe patients offering the, at least at my center, lung volume reduction surgery uh, is still something that we, you know, is important to consider. I, but I also know that uh, lung volume reduction surgery is not quite as widely available. So I, I'm, I, you know, I'm just curious, both Dr. Martin and Dr. Kerman, how do you handle that? At, at Michigan, where I practice, we evaluate them for both at the same time, but I, I know not everyone has both available. Yeah. So that's a great question. I mean, we have lung volume reduction surgery here. Um, we have three excellent thoracic surgeons who are experienced with it. Um, and, you know, after conferring with them when we really first started, um, first started our, our program, you know, we decided that, you know, even though um, there are some data uh, with a mortality, you know, benefit for LVRS, um, the morbidity associated with it um, is really prohibitive in a lot of cases. And so we really shifted away from that. Uh, and uh, valves is now the standard of care here. That's our first line treatment for everyone, um, unless they're not a candidate you know, for valves, um, in which case they would be evaluated for lung volume reduction surgery. But uh, BLVR is our kind of first line treatment. Um, and we um, fully evaluate somebody for that. So when a patient is referred to me, um, we will coordinate their entire diagnostic evaluation to assess candidacy in one single half day. Um, so they'll get PFTs, uh, six minute walk distance, testing, ABG, um, um, a specially protocolized CT scan, uh, non-contrast, and, um, and, and, 
and an echocardiogram as well. Uh, about two weeks after that, we see them in clinic. That way we've had enough time to get their Stratix done. Stratix is the quantitative CT analysis that we do for these patients to actually quantify the degree of emphysematous destruction and fissure integrity by lobe. Uh, and that's how we decide which lobe to target and if there are more than one target. Um, uh, and then after that, if they're a candidate, we set them up for the procedure. And so there's usually about a uh, kind of one to two month time frame uh, between when somebody is referred for this and when they can undergo the procedure. Um, some referring providers will want to do more diagnostic testing on their own. Um, that's okay. But in most cases, we will you know, opt to repeat most testing at our center, just so we make sure everything is done according to the proper protocol. Um, that is ideal uh, for patient um, for patient assessment in this case. Thank you for that. Uh, Can I chime in? Um, yep. Just wanted to kind of like to say, actually, there is data that shows survival benefit for uh, from BLVR um, that was published from our European colleagues. Um, just because they have had a lot more. Um, experience um, and that data was published very fairly recently. I want to say in the past couple of months, two to three months, um, if maybe a little bit longer. But basically, they were able to retrospectively look um, um, at, at the patients that they have treated, and there is actually a mortality benefit from uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. Um, so um, I we work up patients just a little bit different, but again, um, that is, I would say that there's just like every center is going to be a little bit different on how we accept patients. Um, so we, in general, um, just because right now it's, um, um, I work with a group of core group of physicians who evaluate all the new referrals and, um, basically they have kind of like a preliminary, um, discussion with them and, um, order testing based on, um, based on, um, eligibility. Sometimes these patients arrive and they're not candidates pretty much like right off the bat. So we can, um, eliminate ordering unnecessary testing for them. Or on the patients who um, look to be good candidates, we also like try to um, consolidate their testing in as, little, as, as few visits as possible. Um, we also often opt to repeat the, um, uh, uh, opt to repeat specifically the PFT sometimes um, and some of the imaging, just because again, we want everything to be done in a certain way, just so we know that it's um, is standardized and acceptable. Um, but um, I agree the same. Sometimes we, we want to work with the referring physicians um, to kind of help, you know, further the care um, that, that they, they've been offering so far, and then um, either refer them for surgical evaluation or for transplant. Sometimes it helps these patients also to hear from more than one person that how important pulmonary rehab is, um, et cetera, just because they are, sometimes we notice people is like, oh yeah, my doctor told me about it, but you know, I just, you know, did not want to, you know, waste my time, et cetera. So it's, it, we, we see it as like, we're there to kind of add to the therapy and, and then, um, you know, do the evaluation, but also just kind of like a second set of eyes and, you know, a second voice to kind of like tell the patient helpful information. Thank you for that, Dr. Martin, and for also uh, mentioning the recent survival data, just to clarify for everyone. So that's, a, you know, as, as she mentioned, retrospective data, which is a little bit different than the quality of evidence we have for uh, LVRS, which is a prospective RCT, but I don't think we're going to get a prospective RCT for, uh, for uh, valves, and so it certainly is, you know, optimistic, um, but a slightly different level of evidence. Um, Dr. Martin, a question that I get from colleagues a lot that I think is a point of confusion uh, is, uh, is BLVR efficacious for both heterogeneous and homogeneous emphysema? Because there were some differences in inclusion cr uh, criteria for some of the different trials. Can you explain to people what those terms even mean and why they're important and whether this factors into who you decide is a candidate? Um, yes, sure. That's a great question. So in general, um, I would say that there is something that the referring physician should not preoccupy themselves on determining that ahead of time, whether to refer a patient or not. I would just start with that. 
It is important for us on the on the procedure part, just because it does change a little bit how how we approach things. But in general, this procedure is efficacious in both homogeneous and heterogeneous emphysema. So um, there are currently two um, endobronchial valve devices um, approved by the FDA, um, Spiration by Olympus and Zephyr valve by Pulmonix. Um, the important difference, I think, that Spiration has been FDA approved uh, for heterogeneous disease only. And, um, you know, um, the pulmonic valve is approved for both and it has been tested in both in randomized controlled trials. So what we mean by homogenous or heterogeneous disease is pretty much the, the level of destruction and disease distribution. So if there is relatively equal distribution of emphysema burden um, throughout the lobes, then that's what we something we'll, we'll, that's what we will call homogenous type. And if there is more than um, 10 percentage points difference in destruction scores, so to say, between the different lobes, then we would consider that heterogeneous type. And you are correct. There is a little bit of a different, you know, um, cutoff points in terms of the level of hyperinflation that we would like to see in each in each disease uh, phenotype. However, like I said, that is something for us to evaluate and discuss with the patients and um, do there is something that is a decision that is further down the line um, and that I would not basically say there is not a hard cutoff. There is like don't refer this patients because they have homogenous disease and their air trapping is not as pronounced. You know, we would like to kind of like, again, educate the patient and, and have that discussion, but we, we wouldn't want that to preclude the referral. Thank you for that, Dr. Martin. I wanted to kind of circle back uh, just so it's crystal clear in everyone's minds. And I'm going to ask you first, Dr. Kerman, and then you, uh, Dr. Martin, what workup is it that you'd like done before the patient gets to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kerman? Sure. Um, so I would like them to have spirometry uh, with an FEV1 of less than 50%, um, ideally. Uh, and I would uh, like them to have a CT scan of their chest um, just to make sure that there's not something else going on that explains their shortness of, of, of breath. Um, uh, so that's it for me, uh, very kind of minimal routine workup. And then it's just important that they be on maximal medical therapy already, that they be on a llama, laba, et cetera, um, and still be short of breath. And, and what about you, Dr. Martin? Um, I would say the same thing, um, except that the difference is again, a little bit in our workflow. Um, so we basically um, accept anybody who wants to become an evaluated for these valves. We actually have a decent number of self-referrals, people who find us online um, or through um, referring physicians, but um, who come for an evaluation. So they are initially seen by our core group of uh, physicians who we kind of like, we, we limited the number of colleagues who see these patients and they're very familiar with the process and what we would like to see. So by the time they actually come, um, they come to me, most often they have more or less a full workup, um, i.e. PFTs, um, you know, um, a CT of the chest, echocardiogram, et cetera. However, we've pretty much um, we have not put any limit in terms of like reaching the core group of evaluators. Um, so just we, we, we try to educate everybody that, you know, FEV1 of less than 50 and evidence of emphysema or diagnosis of emphysema is what we're looking for, but it's not a hard stop. Um, something else that um, I think is just deserves a little bit of awareness is that um, the phenotype that we're looking for is the emphysema phenotype and that the, this procedure um, is not particularly helpful in patients who have the chronic bronchitis phenotype, meaning people who are, you know, um, have a lot of mucus production, frequent exacerbations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just because it does not really, it's again, this is a mechanical intervention that helps on the air trapping and breathing mechanics, but it really does not do much for the mucus production and the bronchitis phenotype. Uh, Dr. Kerman, talk to me about pulmonary rehab. Is this something that I should get my patients started in before I send them or wait and let you, you send them to rehab? Pulmonary rehab is never a bad thing. Uh, it can only help in my mind. Um, so, uh, I say the more, the merrier, 
Um, I see some patients who are coming to uh, see me for this who have already completed pulmonary rehab. That's fine. Typically, I will re-enroll them uh, periprocedurally, meaning I'll start before their valves and I'll continue it after their valves. Um, um, so it, it is something that can be started before they see me, but it's certainly not a prerequisite, if you will. Um, uh, kind of the main thing that I tell, you know, my referring physicians is, uh, you know, don't, you know, hesitate, don't think too much about this. Um, when you're, you know, contemplating referral, it's better to refer somebody who may not be a candidate yet than to potentially exclude somebody who may benefit from this. Um, um, I'll have referring physicians who will say, oh, I was going to refer, you know, Mr. Smith for the procedure, but he's still smoking. You know, in my mind, that's okay. Um, this is one of the most powerful smoking cessation agents I have ever seen. Um, if I can tell a patient that, hey, listen, you qualify for this procedure, it can help your breathing. All you have to do is quit smoking first. Um, I've seen people who have, you know, failed pharmacologic therapy, uh, you know, quit um, um, to, 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 to get uh, Zephyr valves. Um, so uh, there are not too many absolute uh, kind of contraindications in my mind. Um, the only ones that I really kind of, uh, uh, you, you know, screen out patients for is active uh, lung cancer, if they've had a prior median sternotomy, um, or if they've had a prior lobectomy. Um, those are kind of the big three for me that are kind of absolute no-goes. Dr. Martin, I, I have another question for you. So I, if I have a patient that, say, uh, has gotten annual lung cancer screening CTs for the last few years, will you need to get another CT scan on them? And what kind of, if you do, what kind of evaluation uh, process does that CAT scan go through? So in general, um, you know, first, I, I love it when I see patients who have had regular low-dose CT screenings uh, prior to coming. Um, because again, there is a big overlap between the patients who qualify for um, uh, low dose CT screenings and um, obviously have severe emphysema and um, may benefit from BLVR. Um, the reason why I find it helpful is because even if they, even they're small nodules, we've already probably followed them for a big period of time, can feel comfortable about um, in placing valves in the target area, knowing that we're going to achieve lower atelectasis and probably lose that, um, you know, that uh, lobe from uh, further follow-up. So it's important to know if, if there is any nodules that they, there, have been, there has been stability in them for a period of time. The reason why we order um, an additional scan, even if there is a recent low-dose CT scan, which let's say was fairly normal, um, is more so because we need a very specific technical details on the CT scan that will allow us like, for good um, qualitative assessment of the parenchyma. And the low dose CT screen uh, scans are just in general, um, because of the, the uh, technical specifications that I have, are usually not great in, in using that for qualitative eval. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Martin. I think one of the um, things that uh, might be helpful for those out there listening is what, what should we as general pulmonologists be messaging to our patients to expect? I, I know a lot of people sometimes when they see me are disappointed that I'm not one of the interventionalists, that they're not going to get their procedure on the day that they see me. So could you talk a little bit about, you know, the kinds of things that, 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 that you'll do, how long it'll take, maybe if you even have a guesstimate for the number of patients that, that start the process versus actually make it to valves, because I think it's important for those of us who might be referring patients over to try to set expectations for um, patients appropriately. So um, I'll start with you, Dr. Kermit. Can you can give me just a, a, just a little bit more information about what a patient can be expected so that I can explain to my patients more what they can expect when they start this process? Yeah, I, I think that's a terrific question. Um, um, I think, you know, satisfaction with any procedure comes from having realistic expectations out of the gate. Um, and that holds true here also. Remember, we're not curing emphysema with this. We are managing symptoms. We are trying to Trying to, trying to improve respiratory mechanics in a minimally invasive way that's reversible. 
um, to improve quality of life overall and make people less short of, of, of breath. Um, and so what I, you know, would uh, counsel, you know, a general pulmonologist to kind of relate to their patients before they get to me is that, listen, um, you know, we've done everything that we can up to this point for your emphysema, you're on the right medical therapy, uh, you've maybe done pulmonary rehab, you might be on oxygen, and you're still symptomatic. Uh, you may not be completely incapacitated, which is okay, but you're symptomatic. And uh, I think that we can maybe get you a little bit better. Um, and so I think it is worth it for you to have an evaluation for a procedure uh, that is minimally invasive, that is low risk, that's reversible, uh, and it involves implanting little tiny valves uh, about the size of your fingernail in your airway. Um, and this can actually make you less short of breath, believe it or not. Uh, and there's no surgery involved. And this procedure, again, is not going to cure you, but it might make you a little bit better. So, uh, you know, now you can barely go up a flight of stairs without, you know, uh, feeling like you're going to pass out at the top. So this might get you, you know, to where you can walk up a flight of stairs and not be completely exasperated at the top. Maybe you can walk to the end of the driveway, uh, get the mail and make it, you know, back to the house without planting a chair next to the mailbox. Um, so it's those kind of incremental improvements that are realistic here. And that may not seem like a lot to, you know, the average physician, even pulmonologist, but to these patients, that's incredible. That can really change their life. Um, um, so, you know, now they can maybe play with their grandkids. They can go to the grocery store and not have to ride around in the scooter. Um, and that's worth it. Um, despite, you know, a pneumothorax risk, despite having to stay in the hospital for a couple of days, that's worth it to these patients. Um, and so um, what I would just ask for general pulmonologists is that you um, um, kind of have a low threshold for referring these patients. Again, if they have emphysema and they're symptomatic despite being on their bronchodilators, uh, it's worth a referral uh, for this procedure. Dr. Martin, uh, what, uh, what, what would you advise your referring physicians to tell their patients about what to expect? Um, I, I, I would second a lot of things that Dr. Kerman already mentioned is um, that when I have the discussion with the patients about the procedure, I also tell them that the results can be a little bit on a spectrum. So for some people, the, the improvements can be quite modest, but for some people, they're really um, quite incredible. Um, they're able to do activities they have not been able to do um, in years. And, you know, like Dr. Kerman said, for a lot of these patients being able to take a shower without having to um, sit down or, um, you know, take a pause in between and being able to get clothed and maybe do some household chores is already life changing. Um, so yes, I would basically say have a low threshold. Um, and then when you discuss the procedure, realistically tell them um, that it is very important for them to continue their, that their inhaler therapy will stay. If they're on oxygen, they're likely going to continue to be on oxygen, um, you know, because we, we have occasionally patients who comes through and they're like, I'm hoping to come off of all the inhalers and the oxygen and, you know, basically to be like I was 30 years ago. And, you know, that's not realistic. We basically tell them you have to maintain your medical therapy. This is in addition to what has already been given to you with the hope that we're going to make your daily life better. Um, and in these years, you're going to still get short of breath, but we're pushing, we, we, what we like to do is push that point of dyspnea and having to stop further and also for you to be able to recover quicker, which again, for a lot of patients, that is life altering. I think perhaps one of the best descriptions that I've heard from one of my patients who uh, had a had a good result from uh, the procedure was she told me it was like turning the clock back a few years, like maybe, you know, five, this is how I felt say five years ago. This is what I was able to do five years ago. I thought that was a, a, a good, uh, good description. Uh, one, uh, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> Jonathan, I'm, I'm curious if, what if there's, I don't know, something goes wrong, it doesn't work. How hard are the valves to take out? Uh, it is really easy. Um, uh, it involves about a 10 minute uh, procedure, uh, bronchoscopy again. Um, you go in with little, you know, just routine forceps, just like you would use a transbronchial biopsy for. 
and uh, you grab them and uh, just pluck them out. Um, uh, they're not glued in, they're not sutured in, they're just kind of snug in the airway and that's what keeps them in place. Um, and so they are easy uh, to remove. Um, and you know that in my mind is the true beauty of this procedure. It's completely reversible. So uh, if it causes a complication, um, um, if the patient doesn't benefit, for whatever reason, uh, you have something that's completely reversible. When I see patients for this and I uh, tell them that um, if they're a candidate based on all of the other criteria, um, there's nobody that hasn't elected to move forward with this um, just because uh, in many of these patients' minds, there's not much to lose. Um, they have a poor quality of life because of their shortness of breath. Uh, this has the potential to be life altering, uh, minimally invasively, and is reversible ultimately. Um, so uh, it's worth a shot in patients' minds. All right. So we're getting, I want to kind of get us uh, moving to QA here in a minute, but just sort of final closing thoughts, uh, Dr. Kerman, before we move to that. What, uh, what do you want referring providers to, to know? So um, every week um, I see um, um, a referral come through um, that is usually patient initiated or from some ancillary provider. And I'll see a pulmonologist note um, in their chart. And the note will say something to the effect of uh, patient's shortness of breath at baseline or shortness of breath stable. Um, that's not good enough anymore. Um, when we just had bronchodilators, um, that was a worthy goal, uh, but that's not the case anymore. Now we have new treatments like Zephyr valves that have gold level A evidence, so the highest evidence, that are not clinical trials anymore, that are not experimental anymore. There is no reason that as pulmonologists, we shouldn't aim higher. Having stable shortness of shortness of, of, of breath is simply, uh, you know, not a good goal to have anymore. Now our goal should be having no shortness of breath. That should be the goal. Whether or not we'll get there, I don't know. But you know, valves are a way to kind of move the needle in that direction. Dr. Martin, what would be your closing pieces of advice for people? Um, I would also say that um, you know. A lot has happened, obviously, in the past several years in that field, and the fact that this procedure was included um, in the guidelines as standard of care um, is is it's a it's a crucial piece. Uh, meaning that this this is kind of like the next step after you've maximized medical therapy, and I think just in the medical community um, in general, we we as physicians sometimes are um, slow to adopt change and and new treatments. It, in general, it takes it. Um, I would say it does take several years for for things to become more mainstream, so to say. I think we are at this point. This procedure should be mainstream. Um, it should be something that is discussed in the general pulmonologist office uh, more frequently. All right. Well, uh, thank you for uh, that. I think, you know, from my perspective as a non-interventionist. Uh, it's always hard when something new, whether it's a medication or treatment enters the market because one side of my brain knows that it's there, but the part that sort of, I think we all sort of have this autopilot that we go into when we see patients in clinic. And, and so it's adding this to sort of that autopilot that when we're thinking about, okay, do I check their inhaler technique? Are they in rehab? Have I, you know, smoking issues? All those, have I gotten their vaccinations? All those things that I mentally run through my head, you now have to add. Um, have I, you know, considered whether this patient might be a valve candidate, particularly if their FEV1 is less than 50% predicted and emphysema is suspected. So I think if anyone, if there's like, for me, a take home message, hopefully that would be it. So uh, with the remaining, uh, I think uh, five or 10 minutes that we have, I'd like to move into some of the Q&A. Uh, &Q uh, and I'm gonna start with the Q&A section, but I know we've also got some stuff going on here in the chat. So uh, the first uh, question that came in with the Q&A said, uh, please address the migration of valves after placement. I uh, my understanding is that data from uh, the Liberate trial would suggest it's less than 1%, but Dr. Kerman, Dr. Martin, tell me what you're seeing in practice and how often that's an issue. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. 
Um, I have placed um, a little over 500 valves at this point, and I've had two migrate. Uh, that puts my migration percentage at 0.4%. I have also had only one patient um, have a valve displaced, uh, meaning that the valve basically popped out of the airway. Um, so this was single valve, one patient, and that happened after a very violent fall on the same side where the valves were inserted. Um, you know, she broke ribs and a um, and hand. So probably didn't help. So that's why I'm saying it was, it was not necessarily something that spontaneously migrated, was probably aided by, by an accident. Um, and then what I also say sometimes is some of the valves do require revision, not necessarily because of migration, i.e. leaving the airway where they were uh, deployed, but because of a little bit of like granulation tissue formation or a little bit of like tilting. So there is a possibility that some of these patients will require revision, so to say, um, but, um, you know, that's, that's usually rare and it's not it's not a standard thing that happens with everybody thank you for explaining that that was really uh helpful uh the next question has to do is well, with the ct scan so we mentioned that a patient might get a low dose lung cancer screening ct but that you might need to do a different one so the question is what is the ct protocol that we use for uh bronchoscopic lung volume uh reduction uh, uh jonathan yeah, so depending on the type of machine, um, um, there are certain kernel standards. Uh, then the slice thickness is 0.63 millimeters, ideally. Uh, and that is different than my standard high resolution CT, which is 1.25 by 1.25. So you're talking about something that is kind of double the resolution of a normal high resolution CT scan. Uh, and there's no overlap. Um, and then the pitch also depends on the type of machine. So um, uh, again, rather than going through this with your, you know, techs, um, it's better if you kind of leave this part, uh, to the referring, you know, IP doctor who has, you know, a set protocol with their radiology team who knows exactly what to do. Um, uh, it's just similar, the easiest route. At your place, Dr. Martin? Uh, we also do have a special protocol um, for, for the evaluation. And again, this is a very crucial piece of information that determines patient candidacy and, and, and um, target lobe selection. Um, not only do we evaluate the level of destruction in each portion of the lung, but we also evaluate for fissure integrity. And I know we didn't mention it, we didn't talk a little bit uh, more about that, but fissure integrity or fissure completeness is... is um, the number one predictor of um, technical success of the procedure, meaning that by deploying the valves, we will be able to achieve lobar atelectasis. Um, the average patient gets about three to five valves in each lobe. And I get this question a lot, how many valves um, am I gonna need? And if I get more, is that better? Um, and then the question is no. However many valves it takes to completely occlude the orifice to the target lobe, and that can vary. Uh, but again, um, we are, have only uh, we only have access to basically the orifice of the lobe. If there is collateral ventilation, meaning the fissure is not complete, then their air can basically seep through to you know back, back um, you know call it the back alley channels, and keep the that lobe inflated, which defeats the purpose. And basically, it's not gonna. Um, it's not gonna achieve um, the desired effect. So being able to evaluate ahead of time, what the fissure looks like gives us a good idea of what, you know, how, how big the chances of success are. Right, the questions are piling up. And so <laughs> I'm worried about getting to all of them, so I will do my best. Um, uh, somebody has a question about collateral ventilation and can you figure that out before you get in or is that only something you can figure out once you're actually in the middle of the procedure? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so we do our best to determine it preoperatively, and we do that using the quantitative CT scan analysis called Stratix, um, where we actually quantify how complete the borders are between the lobes of the lung. That's referred to as fissure integrity score. But then the final assessment is actually done intraoperatively. Only with the Zephyr valve is a technology called Chartis available. And what that is, it's a pressure flow transducer catheter that we use to occlude the target lobe and then see if there's continued flow, which can indicate 
collateral ventilation from an adjacent lobe. Uh, and that will let us know if there is collateral ventilation. If that is present, then we can either select a secondary target and assess that one and proceed with valve insertion if that is CV negative or abort the procedure. All right, I'm, thank you for that explanation. I'm gonna direct the next one to Dr. Martin. And that the question is, how do you get access to the Stratic software? Um, so with Pulmonics, we do have basically a portal established, um, so which allows us to upload the CTs from our local PAC system into um, this uh, into the software. And the process is relatively easy. We're basically able to upload the CT, um, and um, after a certain period of time, usually it takes a few days, sometimes a little longer. Um, we get a qualitative analysis back, uh, which um, you know I don't have a sheet of it, but you know um, again this assigns destruction scores to the different areas of the lung. Also, volume. It it, it, it there is also like a volume uh, quantification. Um, meaning how much volume is each lobe and by achieving a telectasis, how much volume reduction are we looking at? We have a lot of questions about pneumothoraxes again. So people want to know the risk. I guess we, we you talked about it in, in the studies. I think people are curious what the risk is in actual clinical practice. Explain why it happens, how concerned people should be. Do these people all need chest tubes? How are they managed? Can one of you uh, walk me through that again? Sure. Uh, like, or yeah. I'm happy to. Go ahead, Rilitz. Like, go ahead, please. Um, so, um, just like uh, Dr. Kerman mentioned before, I, I also like to describe the pneumothorax to patients ahead of time as a consequence of the procedure and not necessarily as a complication. So when we place the valves, um, the lower um, atelectasis, depending on how intact the fissure is, starts happening immediately. Meaning that by the time we actually, the patient wakes up from the anesthesia, you already can start seeing, like if you do a chest X-ray right then and there, you can already start seeing uh, volume loss in atelectasis. So it happens really quickly. And so in these patients in whom it happens really, really quickly, um, then again, you have to you have to imagine that you you are um, sometimes reducing or you are deflating a lobe that can be as big as two plus liters, and when that starts shrinking and the ipsilateral lobe starts basically taking over that space, then a tear can happen and a pneumothorax can happen. We are absolutely prepared for it, and that's what I tell all my patients. Like we actually have um, what we call um, a chest tube back that just um, you know, kind of like follows the patient either from like in on the procedure suite, obviously we have everything readily available, but also at the, um, um, also at the uh, nurse station where they're gonna be staying, they're, the nurses are very much aware of what to look for. Um, the patients are being monitored the entire time. So if there is a sudden change in vital signs, et cetera, people know there's like an automated protocol of getting a stat chest CT notifying us and um, a chest tube, if needed, can happens really, really fast. Most of them do require a chest tube. Um, and then I warn patients that if they do require a chest tube, most of the time their um, hospitalization will be a little bit longer because um, than the usual three to five days because we need to wait for that to heal. Very rarely do they require a second chest tube depending on the um, amount of air leak. Um, and then sometimes we need to partially reverse what we did in order to allow for the area to heal and come back and um, complete the procedure a few weeks later. But in general, it is very manageable. It is distressing to the patient. I think for the clinicians who are maybe not as familiar with it, you know, it can be sound very stressful too. But anybody who is doing procedures like this frequently, we are very accustomed to it to, and managing it as well. Thank you for that. All right, I want to slip in one last question. I am not going to get to all these. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, Dr. Kerman, last question: Is bronchiectasis a contraindication? So uh, it's not. It's not an absolute contraindication, but when you're assessing somebody for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction you want to make sure that the primary factor driving their dyspnea is emphysema and not some other type of pulmonary pathology. So if their dominant problem is emphysema, concurrent bronchiectasis is acceptable. Um, 
keep in mind, you know, valves are not going to address bronchiectasis. They're going to address hyperinflation from emphysema. All right. Thank you so much. I am afraid we are out of time. Uh, but, and so we are going to have to wrap it up. I think we probably could have gone another hour with the Q&A as I'm looking at stuff uh, coming in here. I do want to try to um, um, direct uh, people though to uh, resources on, uh, uh, on this. I don't know, um, Dr. Martin or Dr. Kerman, is there any way people could either re could reach out to you after that? I don't know, on LinkedIn, or is there another good way of, of people being able to ask some additional questions. Sure, um, that to um, to answer questions via LinkedIn. Um, you know that that will be probably an easy way to uh, for people to find this and reach us. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I know I learned a lot, and and hopefully, you know, this is just the beginning. Hopefully, of some ongoing uh, discussions in the pulmonary community about this, um, you know, exciting treatment that we have. Uh, that uh, can uh, really help patients. So thank you so much, Dr. Martin and uh, Dr. Kerman for your uh, incredibly insightful presentations. I really appreciate it.